And can we just introduce now um, Professor Margaret Ledworth, who lives in Lancaster, where she is the Emeritus Professor of Community Development and Social Justice at the University of Cumbria. And Professor Ledworth is a, also a coordinator of the International Collaborative Action Research Network and an author of publications such as Community Development, a Critical and Radical Approach, Community Development in Action, and Participative Practice, Community-Based Action for Transformational Change. Marcus, um, Input this morning is going to cover um, opportunities the pandemic offers by shining a light on structural inequalities, how we can move forward in CLD to claim an important role in a movement for social change. So it's over to you, Professor Ledworth. Thank you, Ross. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for your patience and a, an enormous thank you to Karen for stepping in when my technology failed. And I'd just like to pick up on such an important point of hers to start with. We should be angry, really angry. And when she said that, I thought about Nelson Mandela in 2005, when he came to Hyde Park to talk to the End Poverty Now rally. And he said poverty is a violation of human rights akin to slavery and apartheid. So that's my opening thoughts in reaction to Karen's wonderful talk. I use stories a lot, and that links to what Karen was saying as well. They're so powerful and they're so natural. Paula Freire believed that the theory and action of social justice, of CLD, begins in the everyday stories that people tell about their lives. So today I've come as a storyteller. I've written a story with five chapters, each one followed by a thought provoking question, and then a space for thoughts to catch up with words. A space for you to jot down any reactions you might have in the moment so that they live on beyond the time we share here today. My story's called, What Kind of World Do We Really Want to Live In? It involves a critique of our inhumanity to each other and the planet and a post-pandemic rediscovery of our potential for kindness. So chapter one is all about values. It's about how the values we live by change the world we live in. Practice, I think, needs a past, present, future perspective. And by this, I mean that if we look at where we've come from, we can see much more clearly where we want to go. So to start with, let me wind back in time to the Second World War. Life in Britain for six long years was grim. Violence, destruction, fear permeated everyday lives. My mother was 10 at the outbreak of war, so her young life, was about community, compassion and pulling together. My early years were surrounded by dereliction, dangerous bomb sites were playgrounds, grimy industrial buildings reached skywards with their insides exposed and half crumbled houses gave glimpses of flowered wallpaper of a life that used to be. All this punctuated the post-war landscape of my childhood. I picture it as colourless, dull, dirty, monochrome. Food was rationed and life was a struggle, even though the fear and violence of war was over. Grief, loss and rebuilding of lives and communities was very present. But what I didn't know as a little girl growing up amidst the remnants of war was that new ideas had come out of the violence and destruction. People cared about each other in the struggle to survive. There was a political will for a common good. We could call it a politics of belonging in which the well-being of all was a shared responsibility, one based on values of cooperation and connection. This, I think is the mark of a true civilization, a commitment to everyone's right to benefit from wealth and progress, agreement that we have a common right to mutually flourish, 
and to play a participatory role in society. In the post-war period, people started to see differently. Values changed and formed the basis of policies of compassion. These had never been known before, and we all flourished. This is the world I was born into. I had no memory of two world wars that went before and a global, a global economic depression. I didn't experience the fear, destruction and deprivation. My community was defined by war, but I grew up feeling the post-war hope that opportunities were endless, jobs were abundant and choices were mine to make. What an exciting time of infinite possibilities. And much of this optimism was due to the good times created by the political will that brought about a welfare state based on values of compassion. Almost overnight, education and healthcare became free for everyone. Excellent quality council housing grew across the country. Employment conditions were protected by unionized labor and workers' rights and a social security system ensured that there was a safety net for hard times. It was an everyday utopia, a human rights vision based on social justice values. The very same values that lie at the heart of CLD. Sadly, none of us realize just how easily this could change just by telling people a different story. Let's pause for thought for a moment. Just consider how values underpin the way we relate to each other, how they inform the policies we pass and how they create in turn the world that we live in. CLD values are at the very heart of our practice. We need to be able to name them, explain them and apply them as a lens that checks the integrity of practice at every stage. Just reflect for a moment, in what way are CLD values integrated into your own practice? Let's move on to chapter two, which is about critique or getting under the surface. In 1947, at the very time the welfare state was underway in the UK, something very different was happening in Switzerland. Hidden away in the little village of Montpelleron, a group of 40 men were plotting a very different story indeed one based on very different values, values that would come to replace cooperation with competition and compassion with greed. It became, in time, known as neoliberalism, and it was an extremely strange idea indeed. In fact, so strange that this little group knew better than to put it into the public domain until the time was right. People had always been told that the market served society. How could a small group of men convince the world that profit comes before people and the planet? It was the very antithesis of the values of the welfare state. Nevertheless, they were determined to give it a go, prepared to wait for the right opportunity before going public. What an enormous challenge to convince people to see life upside down. The market ruling people, the rich deserving even more riches, and the poor and the planet paying for all this greed and excess. The values of compassion implicit in the welfare state had a massive impact on the health and well being of society. Not many people realize 
that equality peaked in 1978 when Britain was the second most equal country to Sweden in Europe. It was a wonderful achievement and opened up many possibilities for a society that could be inclusive and happy. But in 1979, Mont Pelerin Society's big chance appeared. Margaret Thatcher entered the political stage as Conservative Prime Minister, and this was a pivotal point in not only British, but in world history. She really liked the ideas of the Mont Pelerin Society and their story of individualism. The key plot was the free market, uncontrolled and driven by profit. She came up with many popular slogans and repeated them over and over again until the people believed her. There's no such thing as society, only individuals and their families. It's good to be greedy. Profit comes before people. The rich need to get richer and the poor need to tighten their belts. Wealth will trickle down. I was a grassroots community worker at the time and we were alarmed but caught in the spotlight. Nothing trickled down. This was the first big lie. The rich got even richer and much more greedy and the poor were dismissed as work shy welfare scroungers. Make people poorer and pillage the earth in the name of profit was the moral of the story. There is no alternative. That was another big lie. And it was such a compelling story. We all shut up and got on with it. Community ties were weakened and individualism became the order of the day. Two years later in 1981, Ronald Reagan became president of the USA. He liked this story too. Thatcher and Reagan became good pals, but more importantly, together they became the most powerful leaders in the Western world. And with the help of the two of them, neoliberalism went global. The poorest of the world suffered dreadfully, but the rich got richer than ever. Inequality within countries and between countries soared. And before too long, a global super rich appeared. It was so odd, you know, because they came to have more in common with each other than with their own cultures of origin. They were told it's good to be greedy. So they went out and bought lots of really expensive stuff to show us how very important they were and they found tax havens to avoid paying their fair share of taxes. Consumerism was born. Not only did these values create escalating world poverty by exploiting the poor of the world, but they polluted the planet with throwaway consumption. Just pause to consider how my story highlights the powerful role of counter-narratives to change the values we live by and therefore transform the world we live in. I suppose my thought at this stage is, if it was that easy to change the values, surely we can do it all over again and change them in the right direction. Critique, you know, is fundamental to community learning and development practice. If we don't contextualize local lives in their political times, we're going to keep on reacting to the symptoms on the surface, those symptoms of oppression. And by doing that, we're distracted. We just allow the root causes of oppression to continue churning on unabated. Just take a moment or two 
to think, how does critique of social injustice influence your practice? Let's move on to chapter three, speaking truth to power. Once upon a time in austerity Britain, a visitor from Australia spent a fortnight traveling round, listening very carefully to the stories people told about their everyday lives. He just happened to be not only a human rights lawyer, the UN Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. In the fifth richest country in the world, he witnessed with his own eyes such extremes of poverty and destitution. Long queues for food banks, people sleeping rough on the streets, the sense of deep despair and hopeliness, hopelessness loneliness and isolation. He was shocked. He said, local authority budgets have been so dramatically cut by government policies that the safety nets for poor communities have been destroyed. Libraries, youth and community centres, public spaces, parks and recreation centres, all closed or sold off. But worst of all, he said, are the cuts in benefits that have deliberately targeted the poor, women, ethnic minorities, children, single parents, asylum seekers, and people with disabilities. He shamed UK poverty as a political choice and not an economic necessity. Choices had been made for tax breaks for the rich at the same time as austerity measures for the poor. Everyone, he said, with their eyes open, can see the suffering. It's all around you. And this could so easily have been avoided had there been the political will. But, he said, just one player suddenly refuses to see the situation for what it is and that's the government. For almost one in every two children to be poor in the fifth richest country is not just a disgrace, he said, it's a social calamity and an economic disaster all rolled into one. This report was presented to the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva accusing UK austerity measures as violating UN human rights agreements on women, children, disabled people, and economic and human rights. Just pause for thought to consider why we turn away, walk on by, accept food bank street sleepers, hungry children as normal, it is so important to question everything, expose what's being normalised as a violation of human rights. CLD involves setting the context for teaching to question as the route to critical consciousness. And speaking truth to power is one part of that questioning. Just take a moment or two to reflect on your practice. How do you create the context for questioning the critical connections between local lives and the wider political context where structural discrimination is rooted?
Let's move on to chapter four. This is about empathy, a revolution in compassion. I'm going to tell you a very well-kept secret. People aren't naturally selfish and greedy. This is simply not true. Developments in neuroscience over recent years prove with beyond doubt that human brains have got an empathy circuit. We're wired for empathy. We need to feel connected. We thrive on being kind to each other. This is how we've survived and it's how we stay well and healthy and become more fully human. In the National Values Survey, top of the list, UK people chose community, friendship, compassion, kindness and equality. We care deeply about each other and the planet, and yet we've created a culture that is at odds with the world that people really want and need. A pandemic, the result of environmental degradation, appeared without warning, surging along the fault lines of discrimination and killing most seriously along the cracks cleaved by poverty, along the intersections of racism, xenophobia, misogyny, age, disability. A reminder of our inhumanity, but also a wonderful opportunity for change. Living through lockdown, people rediscovered community as a natural way of being. We all have the chance to see it's the greed of the rich that's the problem, and it's everyday folk that make the world go round. Nursing, delivering food, collecting refuse, providing care. We got a sense of becoming more fully human, listening with empathy, responding with compassion. So let's put inequality and environmental degradation at the heart of our conversations and develop a wisdom of the heart and mind. Here's an idea. Imagine that we replace economic growth and profit with human kindness and friendship. Not just random acts, but the way we organize everything. Reconnecting with empathy to take our place in the ecosystem with responsibility for each other, those we know and strangers, all part of the family of humanity. Interdependent, all part of the ecosystem of the planet that's our home. Pause. Consider the implications for CLD. This scientific evidence that we have an empathy circuit in our brains, we need to be compassionate to be fully human, has massive potential for changing our relationships with each other. What if we put empathy and compassion as the main aim of everything about CLD practice? What then? Chapter five is about counter narratives. It's about if we change the story, we change the world. And it all begins with curiosity and imagination. Seeing differently leads to thinking differently. It opens our imaginations to new ideas. Karen talked a lot about well-being, mental health problems. We know they've escalated as poverty's got worse. But if, say, people's mental health problems are a consequence of poverty, then targeting poverty as the cause improves mental health as the solution. Same applies to food banks, child hunger, destitution. Target the cause, not the symptom. 
in order to stop the problem worsening. Imagine a world in which things are different. Where profit's been replaced by well-being as a measure of success. And where we factor in the cost to the planet of what we do. Instead of creating a gig economy without worker protection or any political voice, a worldwide redistributive tax on wealth would change poverty overnight. And a three day working week would release people to connect with family and community, to care for each other and the environment. A universal basic income would be an investment in human dignity and a redistributive justice for the colonization, exploitation and slavery of the past. It's been tried out around the world, you know, to huge success. And it's cheaper than keeping people in poverty. People get their dignity back and the autonomy to have control over their lives. Because there's always the argument, oh, people will become lazy, they'll just take benefits. The reality is that UBI gives people their dignity and they actually work harder and get involved, as we all know, those of us who've worked in community for many years. So does worker ownership of the workplace, citizens' assemblies, free education for all, collective ownership of common land, and becoming good ancestors for seven generations to come. In all these ways, utopias within our grasp, we have the answers at our fingertips. All we need is the imagination and courage to give progressive ideas a hard sell in a counter narrative of interconnection. Well, my time's almost up, but let's just take a moment to remember we do have choices. There are plenty of alternatives to the world we've created. Just imagine yourself in a new world, one you'd feel proud to be part of. What does it look like? How are people relating to each other? What's really important to them as they go about their daily lives? And how is it different from the world we're in today? Finally, just let me share a few concluding thoughts with you. Instead of choosing a dominant ideology that's based on social injustice, which is what we have, we could choose one that has a social justice outcome so easily. To do that, we simply need to change our values from competition to cooperation. And that would change our relationships with each other and the planet. I really do believe this is the route to peace and justice for all, from a politics of hatred to a politics of compassion. We've got all the tools at our fingertips, we just lack the political will for change. And that's because people are prevented from thinking for themselves. And this is where CLD is a vital catalyst for change. And these are some of the critical points in practice. We need to voice our values at a snap of the fingers, be able to discuss CLD values and what they mean become critical, question everything, situate local lives in their political context. Imagine alternatives and create counter narratives of interconnection. Aim high, just like the anti-slavery campaigners and the suffragettes and act together for change from local projects to global movements. Thank you for listening to my story. I do hope you feel inspired by some of the ideas and that you'll discuss them together, that they've created an interruption.
our world's in crisis. It's an epoch in world history that opens up a space for change. And my challenge to you is resist going back to normal, to a normal that is just not at all normal. Managing problems created by an unjust system. Seize the opportunity to think differently. A politics of hatred leads to a culture of violence. So let's stop concentrating on putting right the symptoms of a corrupt system. Let's focus on the world we want to live in, beginning by telling a story of empathy, compassion, caring. In fact, why don't we make this our Mon Pelleron moment? Margaret, thanks for that input. It's been absolutely fascinating sitting and listening to you. I love the approach that you've taken in terms of telling that story, because I think whilst there's lots and lots of it, uh, and I would just say to you, I've, I've lost my pencil sharp and I've lost my pencil case, so, I've had, so the kind of being able to take notes is I was flying through it and um, everything that you were saying because there was so much um, that was being said. But overall, I think the approach that you've taken, that storytelling approach, I think mm -hmm. what really reinforces is the power of stories. And we should never underestimate the power that story has. And if you think about learners and the communities that we're working with now, we really need to get their stories out there, we need to be heard. And often we talk about listening to communities. But I think what you've been saying all the way through that um, presentation is not, we need to move beyond listening to communities. We need to now start actually hearing communities and hearing the stories that sit behind those individuals, those learners, those communities, and getting them out there. And our task, I suppose, is how we do that professionally and how do we use our professional practice, our competencies, our values to actually get those stories out there to help learners and communities understand what those stories mean to them, mm -hmm. to their families, to their communities, and then build on that um, collectively. So that's certainly something I've taken in from that input. There's also early into the input you made a statement around how your life and community being defined by war, but future mm -hmm. defined by hope and values of compassion. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to relate that back to the discussions that we've been having today and hopefully we'll be having next week and thinking through, you know, we've now got communities and a whole generation of young people and children whose lives have got redefined by the lasting impacts of a virus. Mm -hmm. So again, what's our professional role in helping those communities, those young people, um, define their future and aim high mm -hmm. what they want the future um, to look like. So I've been absolutely engrossed um, in the story that you were telling and found it really fascinating and really um, thought-provoking, and I'm sure others um, on the call have done that well. 